All right, welcome to the second part of the chapter 17, 18, 19 lecture. All right, so in the last video lecture, we figured out a bunch of things about stars. We classified stars. We came up with a method to determine how far away stars are. We introduced the concept of luminosity, and we talked a little bit about the different sizes for stars. So where we are in this class is actually quite similar to uh, the state of astronomy in like the 1910s or so, where um, there were published in academic journals these huge tables of properties of stars. They had temperatures, luminosity, sizes for all these objects, and uh, it was kind of overwhelming to see all this data. And uh, a couple astronomers, somewhat independently, uh, developed a visual means to organize all of this data. And um, the two individuals are Enjar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell. And because of their efforts, this visual diagram that they created is named after them. It's called the Hertzsprung-Russell Diagram. And we sometimes just abbreviate that to HR diagram, just HR diagram for short, right? And the HR diagram is a plot of stellar data. It is uh, a plot of luminosity versus temperature. Luminosity is on the vertical axis and temperature is on the horizontal axis. Um, we typically plot luminosity and temperature, although there are things that are... Um, uh, similar in concept, for example, in place of luminosity, you could put absolute magnitude because those things kind of go hand in hand. And temperatures can also be replaced with spectral types because the spectral types follow a temperature sequence. So, But any kind of diagram that plots luminosity or the like with temperature or the like is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And it is a tool that we use in astronomy. And this is an incredibly powerful tool. And you will see a lot of Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams in this class from here on out because this is a widely used tool to really communicate a lot about stars. Uh, we use this to plot groups of stars, to compare stars to each other. We can use these diagrams to track the life cycle of stars when we look at star, stellar death and stellar birth. We track how the star changes on the HR diagram. It's just an extremely powerful tool. You know, if you look at any academic journal uh, today, and if it has to do with collections of stars, you can almost guarantee you will see a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram somewhere in that paper. So let's look at what this thing is. All right, so here's an example of a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Now, this is obviously something that's been drawn from a textbook, and it's, you know, very snazzy and how it looks and colorful. And, you know, these don't generally look this way, but, you know, I'm trying to educate you. So we're going to choose something that's a little bit more appealing to the eye. Um, so here we go. Uh, on the vertical axis is luminosity. Now, the luminosity that's here is seated in terms of stellar units. So you'll see it's L over L sun. So these numbers are relative to the sun. So a luminosity of one means a star that has a luminosity similar to the sun. And 10 to the 4 is a star that has 10,000 times the luminosity of the sun. So there's luminosity on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we have temperature. Now you'll notice something different about this compared to graphs that you normally see in, say, your math class. The, temp the temperatures actually increase as we go to the left. Usually you, you see numbers they increase as you go to the right, but the numbers increase as you go to the left here. And the reason why, if you're wondering why this is, is because many, many, many years ago when they first made this diagram, it was based on magnitudes, right? And magnitudes have this kind of backwards nature to them. So we kind of just stuck with it. And now, uh, you know, we have this backwards temperature scale here. Uh, if you look at the top, there is spectral types. So we have temperature and spectral type included in the same diagram here. Uh, you can use one or the other or both. Uh, one thing you might see sometimes is on the right-hand side over here, you might see um, absolute magnitude. All right, so what's going on here? Well, 
when you put stars on the atrial diagram, and by the way, when I say put stars on the atrial diagram, it means you have to know their temperatures, you have to know their luminosities. Once you have that, you can place them somewhere on this atrial diagram based on their properties of temperature and luminosity. So when you do that, we find that the vast majority of stars, over 90% of stars, lie on this very narrow strip that goes from the upper left in the diagram to the bottom right. And we call this the main sequence. The sun is here. Yeah, here's our sun. Um, and uh, yeah, our sun exists on the main sequence. And like I said, 90% of other stars are located on the main sequence. This is a location where a star is in an equilibrium, right? Hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, it's doing fusion in its core. It's kind of in the middle of its life, just doing fusion, hanging out in space. Nothing special about it, right? So middle-aged stars, basically. And uh, we find that in addition to the main sequence, there are three other uh, places where we would find stars on the nature diagram. Uh, two of those lie above the main sequence, and they're called the giants and the supergiants. And um, we'll see why in a little bit here. Uh, but those are two regions that lie above the main sequence. So these are uh, the way we describe this is these are objects that have a similar temperature to main sequence stars, but uh, they're above the main sequence because they have a higher luminosity than normal. Right? And then we have the white dwarfs down here. Uh, they are below the main sequence, similar logic there. Uh, they have similar temperatures to main sequence stars, but they are uh, much, much fainter in the luminosity. So four categories altogether, main sequence, giants, supergiants, white dwarfs. Now you may see over here, it's like, whoa, Dr. McGovern, what is this? This looks like a fifth category over here. Well, it's not. <laughs> um, the red dwarfs is not a fifth category. It is considered part of the main sequence, but it is a location where we do find a large number of stars. So many stars that sometimes it's just given its own name, even though it's not a distinct region. Um, so... Red dwarfs are just what we call lower main sequence stars. I don't really like the term red dwarf. It doesn't really communicate um, anything very helpful, especially when it has a name like the white dwarfs, um, and it makes it seem like they're similar. Uh, the only thing similar about them is they're both small. So um, I will usually describe what's called the red dwarfs as low mass main sequence stars because that's really what they are. They're main sequence stars with a low mass. So. All right, so what can we say about stars that are not on the main sequence? All right, well, let's look. All right, so you see I have this vertical dash line that I put on the main sequence here. And um, you'll notice that there's a main sequence star on that line. There's a giant star and a super giant star on that line, right? So um, what can we say is similar about these three objects? Well, they have the same temperature, and they have the same spectral type. They are K-stars. Okay, great. But they're not the same, right? They have similar temperatures, but they have different luminosities. So why would that be? Well, remember the last thing we talked about in the previous lecture was size, right? The giants are called the giants because they're larger, right? For a similar temperature, they are brighter. Why would they be brighter? Well, they have to have more surface area. So the ones that are above the main sequence, at least the first group is called the giants. It's great. Then you go above that. And then we have the super giants. What a great name, because guess what? They are even giantier. They're larger than the giants. And um, yeah, they're even further up in luminosity, so they must be even larger, right? So we actually could determine how much larger, by the way, right? So uh, for the supergiants, okay, if you notice, this particular supergiant here has a luminosity of 10 to the 4, 10,000 times larger than the sun. Now, if you remember the Seffen-Bolton law, um, the luminosity uh, went as radius squared. So the question you want to answer is, what number can you square and get 10,000? 
Well, you could square 100 and get 10,000. So that means the supergiants must be 100 times larger on average than main sequence stars. Giants that you can't see because the label's hidden by this, by this uh, caption over here. But um, giants are about 10 to the second power, or that would be 100 times more uh, luminous. What number do you have to square to get 100? 10. So giants are about, at least this giant here, is about 10 times larger right, than the sun. There's actually a group in the supergiants. There's a group above the supergiants, right? Uh, guess what they're called? They're called the super duper giants. No, they're not. <laughs> there actually is a group above them. They're called, actually called Hyper Giants. But I think Super Duper Giant would be a better name. It kind of uh, dries home how much bratter they are. Super Duper. All right. Sorry. Um, bad joke there. Okay. Um, what about White Dwarfs? Well, similar logic here. If I draw a dashed line at the B stars, for example, here, um, white dwarfs are lower, right? They're less luminous for a similar temperature. They must be smaller, right? In fact, if you do this for the sun, if you look at the sun's location, you go straight down, you would get to uh, a white dwarf that's about 10 to the minus 4 in terms of its luminosity. 10 to the minus 4 could be achieved if you had an object that was 100 times smaller than the sun. Well, what kind of object? What kind of object is 100 times smaller than the sun? The Earth is 100 times smaller than the sun. Yeah, there are these white dwarfs. Now you will learn more about them later, but I'll just tell you now: white dwarfs are dead stars. These are stars that have already died. What happens when stars like our sun die is they shed a lot of their outer layers until the core of the star is revealed. And, but at that point, once the core of the star is revealed, it's no longer really a core in the sense that there's no fusion there anymore. The star is dead. But when that core comes out, that core is about the size of the Earth. So that was kind of an amazing discovery, and it's something that came out of Hertzsprung-Russell diagram you know, investigations. You know, there are apparently objects that we see in space that, based on their temperatures and their brightness, are objects that are similar in size to the Earth. These are stars. I mean, not technically stars because they don't have fusion, but, you know, there's some potentially things you'd see through telescopes, and they resemble stars, and they're the size of the Earth. And that's kind of extraordinary that we can see something the size of the Earth, you know, many, many, many light years away. So anyway, uh, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram makes these observations like very apparent to us. And that's one of the benefits of this visual guide that we have here to stars that we can just see based on their placement, how their properties must be different. So that's, that's a really amazing thing. And there's actually a lot we can do with this. And you'll see as we get through the rest of this lecture here, there are so many things we can determine about stars just based on their placement, placement alone. Right? All right. So anyway, in this picture here, this is a similar HR diagram, but I place some lines to indicate objects of a similar radius, okay? So when it comes to the main sequence, you can see this line right over here where the sun is, is an R of one. So that means similar in size to the sun. Um, main sequence stars can be larger than the sun. Uh, they can be almost as large as 10 times in size. And in terms of uh, being smaller, you can see that uh, stars can easily be 10 times smaller and even more than that. If they're sufficiently cooled and they're cool, cool in their temperatures, I should say. Uh, for giant stars, we see that stars can be 10 times or 100 times larger in size. The super giants can be 100 or even a thousand times larger in size. Now, a thousand times larger in size is ridiculous. Like, what's a thousand times larger than the sun? You know what a thousand times larger than the sun is? The uh, orbit of Saturn is a thousand times larger than the sun. So if you take our sun out and you put Betelgeuse, where Betelgeuse is right here, right, in its place, it's the surface of Betelgeuse would go all the way out to Saturn's orbit. So all the inner planets are gone. Jupiter, 
gone. Saturn, Saturn's in a sweat because the field juice is right up on it. All right. That's amazing. And look, I mean, it says there's another one up here, 10,000 times the sun's rays. There, there are stars, not many, but we have witnessed some stars um, that are larger than our solar system. Right? That's, that's pretty wild. Um, now, you may be curious, like, what's going on with these things? Why are these things so big? And, and we'll get into the details later on in the class. I'll just tell you now, these are stars that are about to die. One of the things that happens to stars um, at the end of their life is as they run out of fusion reactions, so they, they basically start to run out of nuclear fuel for their fusion reactions, uh, there is a mechanism that causes them to expand to a larger size. And that's what's happened with the giants and supergiants. They're on their way out. Uh, down here for the white dwarfs, you can see that almost all of them lie on the 0 0.01 radius line, which again, 100 times smaller than the sun. Um, again, size of the earth, actually. All right, now, something else that you'll see on this diagram here. You'll notice that I labeled two different locations. There is a location I labeled A and a location that I labeled B. And one of the things that you can do with the Hertzsprung Russell diagram is you can compare two stars to each other and say a lot about them based on their placement. So when you look at these two objects, A and B, okay, which object do you think is hotter? Think about that. Well, the answer is B. B is hotter because it lies further to the left on the diagram. A is further to the right. You can see A is an M star, and B looks like it's probably an F star. So B is hotter. Great. Which star is brighter? Intrinsically brighter is A. A is further up on the diagram. So if you're further up, that's brighter. If you're further down, that's fainter. Okay. A is a supergiant. B is a giant star. Okay. I can ask you which object is larger, and you should say that A is larger. Now, I don't want you to say A is larger just because, oh, well, it's a supergiant. Supergiants are always bigger. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, you actually can see there, you, you can actually have some giants that could be larger than supergiants. That is a possibility if they're sufficiently cool. The rule that you want to use, though, to determine how large something is. So if you have a collection of stars, and the question is, which of these stars is the largest star. The rule is what star is closest to the upper right-hand corner? A is the closest to the upper right-hand corner. The upper right-hand corner represents cool temperatures and high luminosities. And that would be the result of being very large in size. So of all the stars on here, the one that I drew, A, is the closest to the upper right-hand corner, and that's how we determine if it's the largest or not, okay? So that's the rule. Upper right-hand corner is larger. Obviously, bottom left corner would be smaller, except the white dwarfs are always just kind of uniformly the same size, and it's the size of the Earth. All right, so if you're asked questions about hotter, cooler, brighter, fainter, larger, smaller, you know the answers. On the HR diagram, okay, hotter is further to the left, cooler is further to the right. For in terms of brightness, further up is brighter, further down is fainter. In terms of size, upper right-hand corner okay, is the largest object. All right, so remember that because you'll definitely have to know that for some of the stuff we're going to be studying later. Okay, And I'm going to test you on this at the end of this lecture, Okay, if, whether you follow this stuff or not. Okay, Let's keep chugging along here. All right, now, because we have the HR diagram, because you saw these differences in brightness, right? Here, let me go back, right? This, this right here. <clears throat> when I was talking about giants, supergiants, this vertical line, all of these objects would be classified as K-stars. And you can see that's a problem because a classification ought to be unique. Now, all these are K-stars, but they're clearly not the same. They're different. So we do need to create a more robust classification system to take into account brightness differences. And so what you see here is the near complete stellar classification of stars. I put a little asterisk up here for complete because it's actually not complete. Sorry, 
Uh, there is some extra stuff on here uh, that I will explain a bit later once it becomes relevant to explain it. And I'll just tell you real fast right now. Um, there's more letters on the temperature class. They've added some letters in the 90s and the 2000s, which was actually part of my research. So one of they did is I looked at things below M. So it's uh, so you'll get, you'll get to hear me rant uh, about my research. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it within five minutes. Um, so five years of my life, explain it in five minutes, okay? That's, that's what I'll do, but that'll come later. All right, so a complete stellar classification contains three elements. And the first one you're already aware of, it's the temperature class, O-B-A-F-G-K-M. O is the hottest and M is the coolest, all right? There's also a number. The number is called a temperature subclass. And the reason why this exists is because with technology, we actually are able to see finer details in spectra, so much so that within a particular temperature class, we see differences among objects, so much so that we actually can subdivide them uh, within their temperature class, and that's what these numbers are. Now, I want to be clear about these numbers. These numbers only have a meaning within a particular temperature class. So, for example, you could have an F2 star and an F5 star. And the numbers are important here because the F2 star is clearly hotter than the F5 star. But if we were talking about a G2 star, like our sun, and an F5 star, well, the numbers don't mean anything now because F is automatically hotter than G. The numbers only make sense within their class, right? And then the third part of this is the luminosity aspects of this. This allows us to determine different types of objects that have a similar temperature class. And it's called a luminosity class. And it's indicated by a Roman numeral. And there actually are many Roman numerals that you might encounter if you've read the textbook. But for the purposes of what we are going to do in this class, there's really only three letters. Uh, sorry, three Roman numerals that matter for us. Um, Roman numeral five is a main sequence star, and three is the giant, and one is supergiant. And we're really not concerned with any other letters than that. Sorry, uh, Roman numerals than those three. Okay. So here are some examples of classifications of objects, and, and here's how you would say these. Our sun is a G2 main sequence star. Pollux is a K0 giant star. Betelgeuse is an M2 supergiant. Rigel is a B8 supergiant. Uh, what's nice about these classifications is they do represent unique locations on the HR diagram. Okay, A Betelgeuse being an M2 supergiant, there's a particular spot on the HR diagram where you find the M2 supergiants. Okay? So um, this is why we consider this to be sort of the more complete one because it is unique positions on a nature diagram, right? Great. Now, you may be wondering, if you are, you look down at this luminosity class and say, well, what, where are the white dwarfs? Wouldn't they be like seven or something? You know, following a pattern here? Um, the white dwarfs are not part of this system. Why? It's due to a technicality. This is the stellar classification system. It classifies stars. And technically speaking, white dwarfs are not stars. Uh, to be a star, you have to have active nuclear fusion in the core, and white dwarfs do not have that because they're already dead stars. Um, so technically speaking, these are not stars, uh, white dwarfs, so, so they are not part of this classification system. They actually have their own classification system. They're just not part of this one. Okay. All right, so I mentioned that the HR diagram is a tool. And um, I'm going to give you some examples of how the HR diagram is used as a tool to determine the properties of a group of stars. So this is going to be really, really a really powerful um, uh, demonstration here. So you'll, you'll see here. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at two different groups of stars that we want to learn more about. In scenario number one, we want to determine the properties of all the stars that are considered our neighbors. So these are all stars within about 200 light years of the Earth. Um, 
62 parsecs is around 200 light years. So this is considered our local neighborhood. We would like to know what stars in our neighborhood are like. Right? Scenario number two is we want to know the properties of all the stars that we can see in the night sky. So you walk out at night and you look at the stars in the night sky and we want to know what they are like. Right? So to do these scenarios, just to be clear, you're going to... Like for case number one, you're going to do parallax measurements for a lot of stars and find all the ones that are within 200 light years. And you're going to get their temperatures and you'll get their luminosities. And then you can put them in the nature diagram and compare them. And then for case number two, this is a little bit easier to do. You can easily just take the, say, thousand brightest stars in the sky and again, gather up their luminosities and temperatures through observations and put them on the HI diagram and see what we have. All right, so let's do it. Snap my fingers. Boom, it's done. By the way, a project like this would probably take like a decade to do, but we've been doing astronomy for over 100 years. So this is effectively we've already done for us. So let's see what we got. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to show you the two HR diagrams. We are going to simply describe what we see, and then we will interpret what we see. All right, so the HR diagram that you see here uh, are the nearest stars. These are our neighbors, right? Uh, the first thing you do in any HR diagram is you find the sun. The sun kind of orients yourself on the HR diagram. You can easily figure out where the main sequence is, white dwarfs, giants, and so on by making sure you identify the sun. Well, the sun's labeled, so that makes it easy for us. But if it was not labeled, how would you determine it? Well, you have to base it on its properties. Our sun is a G star. So you're looking for any kind of G star. You're looking for a luminosity of one. You could also look for its temperature, just shy of 6,000, which is right here. And if you had information on absolute magnitude, uh, you would use that as well. Absolute magnitude is around five. Around about 4.8, but 5 is, is, is okay to use, too. All right, so here's our sun. We see our main sequence. We see stars going down and to the right and up and to the left. Um, we don't see any supergiants. We don't live among supergiants. We don't live among high-mass stars. We don't see any O stars. We don't see any B stars. The highest that we see on the main sequence are, looks like, some A stars there are some small giants that we live among. Um, we see a bunch of white dwarfs, and we see a lot of lower mass main sequence stars. So that's what our neighbors are like. No super giants, no high mass stars, smallish giants, a lot of white dwarfs, a lot of low main sequence stars. Our sun is somewhat uncommon. Uh, there's not too many intermediate mass stars in our neighborhood, so our sun is a little uncommon with that regard. All right, brightest stars. Very different, very different in appearance. The sun is almost unique on here. If you look, it's way down here. Handful of supergiants. Handful of high mass stars. Some giants, some intermediate mass stars, no white dwarfs, no lower main sequence stars. Um, and that's what these two uh, groups of stars look like. All right, so that's the observations. Now what's the interpretation? Well, first thing you'll notice is that there is not a lot of overlap between these two HR diagrams. Okay. So what does that tell you? Well, what it tells you is that stars are bright not because they're close. If the stars that we see in the night sky were bright, then um, then there'd be more overlap here. Um, the stars that are bright are not nearby. They apparently are just very luminous. They either have very high temperatures or they're very large in size. So that's kind of amazing. Our neighbors are not really things we see, right? Look, we have tons of these white dwarfs and these lower main sequence stars, and they don't appear in the brightest stars. So when we look into the night sky, you're not seeing our neighbors. 
you're actually seeing stars that are probably pretty far away, uh, but they show up in the night sky because they're unusual in that their brightness is very, very big. So that's kind of an interesting observation here. What else? Um, now, the picture on the left here, while this is our local neighborhood, it turns out that this is kind of any local neighborhood in the galaxy. Um, and that you typically don't find a lot of supergiants in a given neighborhood. They're, they're rare. In fact, as you go up in luminosity, objects tend to be more rare. So supergiants are rare, and upper main sequencers are kind of rare. Um, as you go down the main sequence, uh, stars end up being more common. So the lower main sequence stars are the most common type of stars. There's tons of them. Not just in our neighborhood, anywhere in the galaxy. So this is why I mentioned before that the sun is a, is a median star. It's not an average star. An average star is one of these lower main sequence stars. That's an average star. Our sun is kind of in the middle in terms of its properties. And that's why I said the word median. Okay. So yeah, those are the conclusions we draw from this. Um, the uh, lower main sequence are the most common types of stars. Um, as you go up in luminosity and temperature, you tend to find things are kind of not as common. Uh, upper main sequence stars are rare. Giant supergiants are pretty rare. Again, the giant supergiants are stars that are in the process of dying. And uh, as a result of that, um, uh, it's a short, well, it's a short period of, of life for these objects. So there's not very many of them just because it, it represents a short period of time for a star uh, when it's about to die. Uh, the other conclusion we drew here was that stars that are in the night sky, the ones that are bright, are bright because of the luminosities, not because they're close to us. Um, some stars are bright because they're close, but most stars are bright because of their luminosity being very large. Okay. So anyway, here, that was examples of how uh, an nature diagram can be really useful for understanding groups of stars. We, under, we were able to understand a lot more about our neighbors and the stars that we see in the night sky because of the HR diagram placements in there. All right, so there are two more properties that we want to discuss for stars. And um, uh, ironically, I guess you'd say that um, these two properties are the most important properties for stars, but they are the most difficult to determine. And that is a star's mass and a star's age. So we'll talk about mass first. Now, we've mentioned mass before in this class. You can think about um, topics we've discussed before. And mass has actually came up <clears throat> a couple different times in the class. Um, one of the topics where mass came up was gravity, right? And... Um, Gravity is an interaction. We could determine the mass of objects based on their gravitational influence. But because gravity is an interaction, we can't look at a single star and know anything about its mass. We need to see uh, stars in groups. And um, that takes us to the topic of binary stars. So for binary stars, this is two stars in a solar system, which um, is actually quite common. Uh, more than 50% of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy are not single star systems, but they're actually binary star systems or higher. You could have a triple star system. You could have a four star system. I'm, I'm aware of one system that has seven stars in it, actually. So this is, um, now that's very rare, seven stars, but binaries are actually the norm. Uh, our solar system, having one star in it, does put us in a slight minority, actually. So that's good news that most stars exist in binary systems. That means we can see an interaction and potentially find out how much mass that they have. Um, this is challenging, though, and, and, and uh, for reasons you may be a little bit surprised about. So let's let's talk about this. All right. So this picture here, um, this probably looks familiar to you. It's the Big Dipper. So it's upside down from how you normally see the Big Dipper. 
Um, but the Big Dipper, if you look in the handle of it, right in the middle of the handle, there are there's a star there, but it's not a star. It's actually two stars. You kind of notice that there is a a little bit of a difference in how that looks. If we zoom into that, we get this appearance. Turns out that uh, on that handle of the Big Dipper, there's actually uh, two stars very close to each other in the sky. This is not a binary star system, though. This is what's known as an optical double. These are two stars that just happen to be in a similar line of sight compared, uh, you know, relative to the Earth here. So they look like they're part of a binary star system, but they're actually not physically associated with each other. They're not gravitationally attracted. In fact, one of the stars is farther away than the other star by like a factor of three. Okay. Uh, in fact, you can probably guess which star is the closer star here. What do you think? In all the stars that you see here, which star is the closest star? You know what? The closest star is probably this little tiny smidge down here that you can barely even see. That, that, that could be the closest star to us. Okay, if you said the star on the right's the closer one to us, well, you made an assumption. Uh, we just went through that in the last lecture. We don't know how far away these stars are. There's nothing in this image that tells you how close these stars are. These stars could just be very luminous, and that's why they appear so bright. And the closest star to us may be one of these little specks down here, or maybe is even an object that's not even visible in this image. That actually could be the closest thing to us in this field. So it's it's deceptive. Again, you can't, just because two stars are next to each other doesn't mean it's a binary system, okay? Now, here's where, here's the, where it gets really wild. Individually, these two stars are binary systems, individually. And this is how most binary stars look. They don't look like binaries. This star in the middle here is actually two stars in a single system, and the one on the left is two stars in a single system. Now, these star systems are so far away from us, and the stars are so close to each other that the resolving power of the telescope cannot reveal that there's actually two stars in these systems. And as you can imagine, this creates for us an enormous challenge because if we're trying to use gravity to measure the mass of stars, binary stars are what we want, but if we cannot see the distance in a binary star system, then gravity is useless to us. So we have to shoot... Uh, for systems that are called visual binary systems. Um, visual binary systems are binary star systems where you can see both of the stars in the system. So in this example here, this is the star Sirius. Now, I've mentioned Sirius before. It is the brightest star in the night sky. It happens to be a binary star system. And it's a visual binary star system. Sirius is actually not too far away. And it's close enough that we actually can see the distance between uh, the two stars in the system. There is the A component, which is this thing right here, which is enormously bright. It is an A star. It's about three times the size of the sun. And then there's a little speck on the left here. That's actually the B component. That's the, that's the companion to the star. And, uh, you know, we actually can use some of the things we just learned here to, to figure out what's going on here. Now, this is a visual binary system. These two stars are the same distance from us. So what's going on here? Now, you'll notice this little speck is blue. So it is hot. It's almost the same color as, as Sirius A. So what is going on? Why is the A component insanely bright and the B component is not bright? What do you think is going on here? Right? What do you think? Size. Yep. Sirius A is an A star. It's three times the size of our sun. Sirius B, guess what that is? White dwarf. It's a star that's already died. It's just as hot as the A component, but it is incredibly small. It's about 300 times smaller than the A component. And so it doesn't appear very bright. Okay. That's interesting, right? That, 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 and we just, we just took a picture, and, and based on the, the, the different laws and principles that we've learned, we can easily discern the nature of these objects. That's 
that's not, that's kind of the work we do in astronomy is is, is we a- ask these questions and, and based on the physical laws that we know we can come up with uh, this information so anyway it's a visual binary system so we watch it and you can see on the left here uh, sorry on the right uh, the progression of the orbits of the system right we've been watching this for decades and we see the stars move in their orbits we draw lines between them and the lines intersect in a particular location, which happens to be the center of mass of the system. That allows us to know the distances involved. That's another part of the gravitational force equation, is distance. Um, now, we don't need to see an entire orbit for this to, uh, to be useful for us. We sort of know, through Kepler's laws, what, how things are supposed to look. These are ellipses. And the center of mass here is going to be one of the focus points of the ellipse. And so after enough time passes, we can kind of extrapolate the rest of the shapes, right? These are all elliptical shapes. So um, Kepler's laws can be used here. And in fact, here's the logic behind this. So as long as we can see a visual binary system, so two stars in the same system, we know that the stars move due to their mutual gravities. Gravity is a function of not only mass, but distance, but we can see the distance. So we can account for distance. And so by observing the motion of stars in the binary system, we can in principle determine what the total mass of the binary system is. This requires us to use a different version of Kepler's third law, in fact, the Kepler's third law that you know of, that we introduced way back in chapter three, I believe it was, was p squared equals a cubed. And when Kepler came up with this, um, he came up with this uh, as a rule for our solar system. And it turns out that that Kepler's third law equation, p squared equals a cubed, is um, true of any solar system with one star of one solar mass. Isaac Newton, because he was a genius, came up with a more general version of Kepler's third law that can apply to not only any other star, but can also apply to binary star systems. And this was his version. Instead of P squared equaling A cubed, instead you could take their ratio, which is would normally be equal to one, for our solar system, but for other solar system, it is equal to the sum of the two stars in the system. Now, for our solar system, you would make a comparison between our sun and Jupiter, but Jupiter has a mass that is less than a thousand times the mass of the sun. So if you add one plus a number that is incredibly small, you still get one, and then the equation simplifies to the, you know, the original Kepler's third law equation. But the one that you see down here is the one that works for um, for any star system, and in particular binary star systems. So what do you need? You need to see the their separation and you need to measure their period. And those are two things that are not really complicated things to do. You just have to watch for a long enough period of time. You have to be able to see their orbits. You have to time how long everything takes and then you can work out um, uh, the mass of the stars in the system. So here's an example of this. Say we find a visual binary system, and let's say that when we track their orbits, that the separation between the stars is on average 16 AU, and we watch the system long enough to know that it takes 32 years for the system to complete an orbit. So we put that into the equation, uh, the A is 16, the P is 32. If you punch this in your calculator, 16 cubed divided by 32 squared is 4. 4. And um, that's the sum of the two masses in the system. Uh, so, you know, if the stars are identical, you would see their orbits would look identical, and you know it's 2 and 2. Uh, let's go back here. Like this original picture I showed here, uh, the center of mass is skewed towards B. So B is probably more massive. Uh, if you look at the ratio of these two distances that are here, that would be the ratio of their masses. So maybe 
if this is the system we are looking at, maybe star B is three solar masses and maybe A is one. That's a possibility. Or, or maybe 2.5 and 1.5. We just know that their sum is equal to four or whatever, you know, Kepler's third law tells us it is. And then based on the relative distances that we see from the center of mass, we can discern their individual masses. So Now, um, you know, this is a nice, a nice uh, calculation. It just requires you to find a visual binary. Now, I will tell you, though, that visual binaries are not common, though. Uh, as I showed you back here, for, um, for the Big Dipper, uh, these two stars, they're called Mizar and Alcor. And as I mentioned, both stars, Mizar and Alcor, are individually, they are binaries. And this is how most of them look. You can't see them as binaries. They are not visual binaries. They, we determine that they're binaries through other things, like maybe the stars eclipse each other. That's called an eclipse in binary. Maybe the two stars have very different spectrum, uh, spectra to them. So that when we look at the spectrum of the single object, we see a blend of two spectrum together, indicating there's actually two light sources. There's various ways we do that. And it turns out that not many systems are visual binaries. It's, it's hard because it, there's like a catch-22 when it comes to visual binaries, right? You need a system that is far enough apart that you can see the two stars but you don't want them too far apart because according to Kepler's laws, if they're too far apart, that their orbital periods are very long. So you may find a system where you can see the two components and then you start to time how long it takes for them to complete an orbit and then they barely move in like a year. And you realize, oh, geez, this orbit looks like it's a thousand years. Well, that's not helpful to you. You can't spend, you know, hundreds of years trying to figure out what this orbit is like. So... You kind of want a combination of things that are separated far enough apart to be visual binaries, but not too far apart. They, kind of, they should be kind of close to the Earth so we can see them. It is not a common occurrence, but again, there are hundreds of, billion, hundreds of millions of stars that we can see, and we know their distances, uh, so that we do have enough examples to base you know, our theories on. So there is a lot of stars that we can do this for. So we actually do know very well the different kinds of masses that stars can have, All right? And we've learned two things, two things. This, uh, this is the first thing we've learned. And by the way, this, just to be clear, this applies to main sequence stars. There is a mass luminosity relationship for main sequence stars. And this is not really a surprise, this makes sense, that as a star becomes more massive, it will be more luminous. Not a big shock there, kind of expected. What is maybe unexpected, however, is that the mass goes to the 3.5 power uh, when we want to characterize this luminosity, which is a rather large exponent. And what it means is that the brightness of a star is very sensitive to its mass. So if you double the mass of a star, you're easily increasing the energy output by more than a factor of 10. And that's a big deal, actually. Now, again, if you think about the sources of luminosity, this kind of makes sense. So here's a, there's sort of a train of logic here that you want to follow. If a star has more mass, then it obviously has a greater amount of gravity. So if you think about the hydrostatic equilibrium that exists inside of a star, we have all these arrows that point down, right? And they create an enormous amount of pressure pushing down on the star. Okay, more mass, more gravity, more pressure inside. Well, then in order to maintain the equilibrium, you have to have arrows that point out of equal magnitude to support the star against gravity. That means you have to have a greater amount of fusion reactions to produce enough energy to push back against gravity. So having more mass makes sense why you would have more luminosity. More mass means more fusion ultimately, and that results in the brightness of the star. 
So, you know, when we talked about in the last lecture, these questions, right? The brightness law answers the question, why is that particular object as bright as it is? Well, it's because it's located this distance and it has this luminosity. Okay, well, why does it have that luminosity? Well, it's because it has this temperature and it has this size. Okay, well, why does it have that temperature and that size? Well, it really comes down to this relationship. Ultimately, the luminosity is determined by how much mass the object has. That determines the fusion. So that's kind of the final, you know, answer to a question you can ask about the brightness of stars. This kind of settles it. This is ultimately why stars are bright. They have a lot of mass. Okay. Now, there's a second thing we can learn about stars. Uh, so we've actually tallied... Um, you know, the masses of stars all across the main sequence and really the HR diagram in general. And what we find is there is a one-to-one -one correlation on the main sequence. Um, if you're lower on the main sequence, you have a less smaller mass. And if you're further up the main sequence, you have a greater mass. Makes sense, right? I mean, low temperature, low luminosity, um, you know, not a lot of mass. As you go up the main sequence, you tend to get a lot of mass. But it's actually more precise than that. Like, for example, our sun is a solar mass. And every other star that's a one solar mass star is always found in the same spot on the intro diagram. Okay, we see a three solar mass star on here. That's like Sirius. Every other three solar mass star is found in this spot. So not only is it one to one correlation, but it is a unique placement too. Um, now off the main sequence, things are not as reliable as you see in the giants here. Yeah, they have a greater mass compared to stars on the main sequence below it, but there isn't a clear correlation, right? We, we see that there's stars of four solar masses in different locations. If you look at the super giants again, they are more massive overall, but there's no clear correlation with mass. So you can say that supergiants generally are more massive than giants, but there's no placement that you can really say in terms of their masses. All right. Now, here's an interesting thing. We have one more property that we'd like to know about, and that is the age of the stars. Okay, so how do we determine the age of the stars? Well, we don't determine the age of the stars, at least not through this technique. We will talk about something a little later in the class where under special circumstances, we could determine ages. But generally speaking, we cannot determine ages, but we can infer what we call the life expectancy of the stars. And what we've learned is that higher mass stars will have shorter lifespans than lower mass stars. So the star up here that's 18 solar masses that appears to be a, an O star is going to have a very short life compared to, say, our sun. Now, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, 18 solar masses, that's a lot more fuel. Why wouldn't they live longer if they have more fuel? It's because fuel is not the only factor, right? I mean, you could think about this in terms of cars. I like to use a car analogy, even though I'm not a big car kind of fan, but this is a good analogy. Now, I drive, for example, a Scion XA. Is it XA or XE? I don't know. It's an XA. It's, it's a little tiny tin foil. It's made of foil, I think. Like if a bicyclist hits my car, I, I'm the, my car is going to be demolished. And I think the bicyclist won't even know it hit me. Like that's how small my car is and how fragile it is it's it's now i bought it many many years ago in fact i've had this car for almost 20 years and um and i bought it because i had excellent fuel economy um it's a 10 gallon tank but i can go like over 300 miles all right and that was that was appealing to me because i had to drive a lot when i was younger so how far i go in my car is a function of two things right it's the gas tank size but it's also the fuel economy now you look at other types of objects, like uh, like an Escalade, right, or like a Hummer. These things don't have ten gallon tanks in them. If they had ten gallon tanks, they're going like down the street and then they're done, right? These things have thirty five gallon tanks, thirty gallon tanks. They need more fuel because their fuel economy is so garbage. 
So there's, again, there's that factor there. So you look at the 18 solar mass star, and you say, well, that has a ton of fuel in it. Yeah, well, guess what? The fuel economy for an 18 solar mass star is garbage. So this luminosity, it goes as mass of the 3.5 power. What does that mean? Well, it means that having more mass, yeah, you have more fuel, but you burn through that fuel far more rapidly. And you actually can characterize the life expectancy of a star as a ratio of how much fuel it has versus its fuel economy. And that ratio for stars is mass divided by luminosity. More mass gives you longer life. More luminosity gives you shorter life, though. And you can actually come up with this relationship here. This is T life is life expectancy. And m to the minus 2.5 power means it's inversely related to it. And here's some examples of different lifespans here. So now the... The relationship here with life expectancy, it's inversely related to mass. So higher masses live shorter lives. Now, we look at our sun and we see the rate at which the sun burns through its fuel. And we know that based on the rate at which it burns through its fuel, it will probably live for about 10 billion years. Uh, just all of the fuel that's available to it in its core. What about a sun, a, sorry, a star that is over that's more massive than the sun, say a 10 solar mass star. That's what I have down here. Okay, a 10 solar mass star, well, it has 10 times the amount of fuel. Yeah, it's true. But because of the luminosity is much larger, it actually burns through that fuel, I think something like 31,000 times faster. Yeah, I think it's about 31,000 times faster, something like that. Or maybe it's, I think it's, it's uh, 3,100 times faster. Okay, yeah, it's 3,100 times faster. Okay, more fuel, but it burns through the fuel much more rapidly. And a star like a, that's a 10 solar mass star only lives for three, 30 million years. Not very long. What about the 0.1 solar mass star? Less fuel, but it burns through the fuel so much slower. And in fact, these stars that are really, really low on the main sequence, M stars, they li can live for trillions of years. Yeah, they have less mass, but they burn through the mass so slowly that they will live an incredibly long time. So we do have a means to characterize life expectancy. Maybe not, um, you know, age yet, although I will describe a technique later where we can do that, but we at least can say some things about life expectancy. All right, fantastic. Now, I want to wrap this up with a little brief exercise here. Um, in this exercise, um, we are looking at a nature diagram here. And I have various positions labeled, and we want to be able to say things about these objects. And so I'm going to go through a series of questions that we're going to answer about these stars. And this is something you really want to pay attention to because you're definitely going to have to do something like this on your upcoming exam um on this material so all right so let's first of all let's kind of orient ourselves here we see there's temperatures in spectral class on the horizontal uh axes here and then the vertical axes we have absolute magnitude and luminosity and so the first question i want to ask you is which letter is the sun the sun would be letter a because it is a g star it has a luminosity of one it has an absolute magnitude of five and has a temperature just shy of 6,000. You can see the main sequence is kind of labeled here because they show that newer strip of data. A is the sun. Other main sequence stars, E, D, C. Now establishing the main sequence helps you establish the other areas. H and K, they are the white dwarfs. I and G, they are the giants. B and F, they are the super giants. All right. What object is the hottest on here? C is the hottest. It's the furthest to the left. What object is the brightest? Well, it's also C. It's the one that's furthest up. What object is the faintest? K is the faintest. What object is the largest? Do you remember? F. Why? It's because it's the closest to the upper right-hand corner. What star is a giant 
that has a similar spectral class as the sun, I. What object do we definitively know has the smallest mass? That would be E. Now, on the main sequence, we can say additional things about stars that we cannot say for things that are off the main sequence. Okay, We know that E is the smallest main sequence star. It is the faintest. It is the coolest. It has the lowest mass. And it has the longest life expectancy. C is just the opposite. C is the brightest main sequence star, the hottest main sequence star, the largest main sequence star. It has the greatest mass, and it has the shortest life expectancy. All right? So those are all things that we can say about the stars that are on here. Um, usually when you look at these diagrams, you figure out what is main sequence, what is giant, what is supergiant, what is white dwarfs, and then once you're able to do that, you can answer a lot of questions and then also realize that if you just isolate the main sequence, there are additional things that you can say simply comparing main sequence objects, right? F is the largest object overall, but C is the largest main sequence star, okay? All right, that takes us to the end of this. Congrats on making it through here. All right, next chapter is Birth of Stars. So exciting.